Hi. Have you ever wondered how this universe that we all call home came to be? Lots of theories about the origins of our universe have come and gone until one theory in particular came along that physicists and cosmologists could agree on. They agreed on it, of course, because there is scientific evidence to support it. And you may have heard of it. It's called the Big Bang Theory. The founders of this theory are two scientists from the 1920s, Georges Lemaitre and Alexander Friedman. They both used Einstein's theory of relativity to prove that the universe is in a constant state of expansion. Then in 1929, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble confirmed this theory again after observing evidence that virtually all clusters of galaxies appear to be moving away from all other clusters, which also indicates that the entire universe is expanding. Physicists agree that the theory is sound because the universe is, in fact, still expanding even now. If you open the Quran and read through all the verses that speak about the origin of the universe, you will find that it confirms what physicists have been saying about the same topic. For example, in chapter 51, verse 47, it says, And it is we, God, who have built the heaven with our creative power. And verily, it is we, God, who are steadily expanding it. What we know about the universe is that space was created first and gave birth to particles, galaxies, stars, the Earth and you and me. In several places, the Quran also addresses the order in which various things were created in a manner consistent with what science has discovered. For example, in chapter 18, verse 51, it says, I, God, did not make them witness to the creation of the heavens and the Earth or to the creation of themselves. The universe expanded from very high density and exploded in gravitational waves. The same gravitational waves from those colliding black holes in space that pass through the Earth, causing the universe to stretch and expand over and over again. In chapter 41 of the Quran, verse 10, it says, In four days he made in the Earth what anchors from high above it and put baraka in it, and equally measured out sustenance of its dwellers for those who ask. Let's break down the meaning of this verse. When God says he made in the earth what anchors from above it, he's referring to the gravitational waves that are coming back from those colliding black holes in space that act as gravitational anchors to anchor the earth and anchor things to the earth. Then God says he put baraka in it. Baraka is a word that people commonly use for blessings, but it actually has a deeper meaning. It means to grow and increase in volume above and beyond expectations, emphasizing that the earth started out small, but constantly grew larger and larger. A strange type of matter caused the expansion of the universe in its early stages. This matter behaved very differently from the matter that we're familiar with today because instead of attracting other matter, it repels it. This has led physicists to call it antimatter. Sounds to me like antisocial matter. Antimatter actually disobeys energy and momentum conservation. It disobeys symmetric charge conjugation and parity. And it disobeys our current one directional time arrow and disobeys causality. Because the early universe was filled with this type of self-repelling, disobedient matter, everything would be pushing against everything else, and that would account for the sudden explosion that gave birth to the universe. Matter and antimatter particles are always produced in pairs, and if they come in contact, they annihilate one another, leaving behind pure energy. So why do we still see matter today? As far as physicists can tell, it's only because in the end, there was one extra matter particle for every billion matter-antimatter pairs. After that, the first stars began to form. They formed from the dense gas of the young universe, which came about when a cloud increased in density and then collapsed due to the action of the gravitational pull of gravity. The gravitational pull of gravity managed to anchor more and more matter from the collapsed cloud, resulting in the densest gas clumping and anchoring together, which eventually led to the formation of stars and even galaxies. The formation of stars then paved the way for the formation of everything else in our universe. You see, when a massive star with a mass several times that of the sun reaches the end of its life, it compresses and explodes as a supernova. And it appears that exploding stars or supernova are extremely efficient at producing the dust or first solid particles that later forms Earth, like planets, rocks and people. Verse 11 of that same chapter in the Quran addresses these points when it says, Then he directed himself to the heaven while it was smoke and said to the heavens and the earth, Come into being, willing to obey or disobey. They both said, We are willing to obey. 
From this verse we can derive many things. Firstly, that space was created before earth. As God says, he created the earth while heaven was a smoke. When God says, while it was smoke about the heavens, it's confirming scientific belief that the smoke resulting from the exploding stars or supernova existed in space for a long time before forming the rocky embryo of the earth. So essentially, the Earth was a giant lump of this cosmic dust, anchored by gravity, but constantly grew larger and larger. Once it became large enough, gravity caused the Earth to become rounded, forming what is called a rocky embryo. And after a hundred million years of this rocky embryo growing, voila, we have planet Earth. The Quran even alludes to the matter and antimatter that existed in the universe in this verse when it says willing to obey or disobey and then concludes by telling us that it is matter, not antimatter, that managed to survive and still exist to this day when it says they said we are willing to obey. When astrophysicists joke, they say supernova have bad habits because they belch out huge quantities of smoke known as cosmic dust. Dr. Loretta Dunn of Cardiff University describes cosmic dust by saying Cosmic dust consists of tiny particles of solid material floating around in the space between stars. It's not the same as house dust, but more akin to cigarette smoke. Cosmic dust was also responsible for blocking the light emitted from stars and galaxies, meaning that for the first 380,000 years or so, our universe was essentially too opaque to shine. Physicist Imre Bartos from Columbia University states, gravitational waves In its affair and adorned the nearest heaven with lamps. By using the lamps as an analogy for light, this verse reflects the fact that the universe was in darkness in its early stages. It further reflects stages. Substance of the message. Allah says, another example I give you. This is do not the unbelievers see. These atheists, these agnostics, the people who deny the existence of God, can they see? In other words, Allah expects them to see, to be able to see, to witness. أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَ رَتْكًا That the heavens and the earth were joined together as one unit of creation. فَفَتَكْنَا هُمَا And he split them asunder. Who is he talking to? Who is he addressing? Kafir. Which Kafir? The Badwins of 1400 years ago? No, no. What can the poor man understand? Well, what did he know about the universe, about the creations of the heavens and the earth? What did he know? He only accepted whatever was said. If this was Allah's kalam, amanna saddakna. We hear and we accept, we believe. This was iman that they had. They didn't have a grasp. Allah is not addressing those unbelievers of the times of Muhammad, sorry, or the unbelievers in the Congo, or among the Eskimos who might not believe in God. No, 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 no. He is talking to the men of science, men of learning, who are now expounding to the world the theory of creation. That these astronomers, with the mighty telescopes, when they're looking into space, and they're analyzing the, the movements in the heavens, and they're telling you as if they did it, if they are the ones who are making these things, this machine, this clock to work, this clock of the universe, the way they explain it as if they are doing it. Such a person with his great learning, he says that this universe came into being with a big bang billions of years ago. Because he's watching the universe and he's noticing that these heavenly bodies are receding from a central place somewhere, is all going out in all directions, moving away, away, away. Like a balloon. When you blow, it gets bigger and bigger. Something like that is happening in the skies, in the heavens. These galaxies, they're receding from us at a faster and faster speed. At a faster and faster speed. And once they reach the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, once they reach that speed, we won't be able to see it anymore because the light that is coming from there, it won't be coming anymore, it's going away. So we must discover bigger and better telescopes to see the sights, the wonders, otherwise we'll miss the bus. So they say that this universe came into being with a big bang, the big bang theory. Who says that? The most learned men of science, astronomers. 
He said, hey, where did you get these funny ideas from? This fairy tale about a big bang. He said, no, 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 it is not fairy tale. These are facts, demonstrable facts. We can demonstrate it, show you what is happening. And from that we can conclude if we had a film and put in reverse gear, so we could see what is happening is all coming back again. With the way it's going out, the balloon, if we can deflate it, you'll see it all coming back to one central point. And there was a big bang. When did you discover this? He said, yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. What is 50 years? Nothing. As an, an illiterate man in the desert, a person who didn't know how to read or write, a person who couldn't sign his own name, he could have, couldn't have known this, could he? He says, no, never. Impossible. Man doesn't know astronomy. He hasn't got the instruments. He hasn't got a telescope. Nothing. In the desert, and among an Ummi people, illiterate people. And he is now telling you, this man in the desert, 1,400 years ago, Kana taratkan, fafatakna huma, and he split them asunder. And you biologists, people who study minute life, microplotism, the amoeba, he says, you know, life originated in the sea, water. Without this water, no life. And they tell you, he says, look, we look back in time, in space, he says, look, this is how life originated. There was a time when this earth was a molten mass, nothing could have survived here, everything boiling, boiling, and over a period of billions of years, you know, the vapors went up and came down, and the vapors went up and came down and started cooling this earth, it took a billions of years and then started life, germs, plant life, and all these things started. At one time there was nothing, and then it started. Where did life come from? He says from the sea. Certain chemical actions, the sun playing its part, and life started from there. Mm -hmm. When did you find this out? It's yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. An illiterate man in the desert, he couldn't have known that, could he? He says, no, never. He says, well, listen. So, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْ And he has made from water every living thing. <laughs> so, أَفَلَا يُمِنُونَ Will you then not believe? Who? You, men of science. You, men of learning. You, kafir. You, atheist. You, agnostic. Why can't you believe?